Hey, welcome everyone to Osteo Boston. My name is Shelley Gladstein, and I'm the host of this program. I just want to welcome you tonight. We're pretty thrilled to have Dr. Michael Lewicki with us. And um, just to review a couple quick things about Dr. Lewicki, he is the um, MD Director of the New Mexico Clinical Research and Osteoporosis Center for um, and Director of Bone Health at Echo University of New Mexico Health Sciences Center in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He is a consultant in osteoporosis and other metabolic bone diseases, supervisor and interpreter of bone density studies, a clinical researcher and educator. He's been um, researching and leading, us, leading the field in new treatments for osteoporosis and developing technology for many years as a principal investigator for many clinical trials. Um, he's past president of the International Society of Clinical Densitometry uh, and founding president of the Osteoporosis Foundation of New Mexico. He's the program director of the Santa Fe, annual Santa Fe Bone Symposium. He is the review editor of the Osteoporosis International Journal, and he is on editorial board of the journal of uh, clinical densitometry. We are very thrilled to have him. And so with that said, I'd like to um, now bring you, um, oops, Dr. Lewicki. Okay. I will go ahead and start. Thank you, Shelly. I, I was telling Shelly before we started that I, since this is a Boston group, I'll have to give you my Boston background. So I grew up in Hingham, Massachusetts on the South shore of Boston. I went to Hingham High School. I slowly headed West. I went to Amherst College. Uh, then I went to Northwestern Medical School in Chicago and uh, uh, ended up doing my residency and training after that in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico at the University of New Mexico. And uh, I married a local girl and I'm trapped in New Mexico, even though the rest of my family is all back around New England. So I'm happy to be here connecting with other New England people. So uh, I, I'd like for this, uh, if you want to be as conversational as possible, so I'm not gonna show you any slides and I'll, cover a few general topics that Shelley suggested you might be interested in. Uh, but then otherwise, I'd be happy to have you unmute and ask me questions and so I can cover what you're really interested in. Uh, in case you're wondering what my uh, virtual background is, that's the Dartmouth College Library. And I've read every single one of those books. So first of all, let's um, Let's talk about what osteoporosis is. It's a, it's a systemic, lifelong skeletal disease that's characterized by low bone density and poor bone quality that weakens bones and, and leads to fractures. But the, it's, it's more than that. It's, it's a very personal disease for anybody who uh, has it and uh, fractures can be devastating uh, experiences sometimes. Uh, they can result in death and disability and uh, what uh, is the worst of all situations is loss of independence. So sometimes I tell people uh, your bone density is very low, you could fall down and die. And, and the answer I sometimes get is, well, I'm old, it's okay, I'm ready to go. But if I say you could fall down and break your hip, wind up in a nursing home, not be able to go to church, uh, go shopping or visit your grandchildren, uh, then that gets their attention. And uh, uh, so I, I think all of us in medicine need to find the right way to uh, communicate messages with patients. Now there's three ways we can diagnose osteoporosis. We do it with a bone density test and we get a number called a T-score. Normal T-score is zero. The more negative it goes, the lower the bone density. And when it's minus 2.5 or less, that's osteoporosis. But if you break a bone that shouldn't be breaking, uh, that's osteoporosis too, no matter what the bone density test shows. And there's a third way we diagnose osteoporosis, and that's according to 
FRAX, the fracture risk calculator that gives us a 10 year probability of breaking bones. And if those numbers are high enough, and even if the bone density is better than minus 2.5 T-score, we can make a diagnosis of osteoporosis. Now we measure bone density with a device called DEXA, dual energy X-ray absorptiometry. And it also does a lot of uh, interesting uh, side uh, tests. And one of them is called TBS. TBS stands for trabecular bone score. And that's a computer uh, analysis of the data from the spine image. And it gives us a number that doesn't have any units, but it's correlated with the internal structure of your bones. So uh, the structure of your bones, as well as the density of your bones is important for evaluating bone strength and your risk of fracture. So we use TBS as an additional input into the FRAX calculation of your fracture risk. So not every place does TBS, but it gives us some helpful information that way. There are newer versions of FRAX coming around that have uh, additional uh, data to support the numbers. Uh, we have other things that DEXA does such as VFA. VFA stands for vertebral fracture assessment. And that's a sideways image of your spine that you can get the same time that you get a DEXA measurement of your bone density. And it allows us to find fractures in the spine that you may not know that you have. So spine fractures are by far the most common fracture related to osteoporosis, but most of us who have fractures in the spine don't know we have them. So we frequently do spine imaging to find out. And if you have a spine fracture that we recognize, that might change your diagnosis from maybe osteopenia before to osteoporosis. It'll change our assessment of your fracture risk to higher than what we figured before. And it might change our decisions about how to treat things. So that's important. Uh, there's other devices and other software that are, are used. There's an, another type of analysis that we can do of the hip called 3D Shaper. And it takes, uh, this is real computer magic, but it takes a, a 2D image that we create from DEXA and converts it into 3D information. And it gives us volumetric bone density measurements of the bone that are pretty good. I mentioned before that osteoporosis is a lifelong disease and that it's a systemic disease. And that's very important for all of you and your physicians to appreciate. And it's often uh, not recognized. So let me give you an example. Uh, say a patient has a bone density in the osteoporosis range, a diagnosis of osteoporosis is made and the patient started on a drug. And a couple years later, they come back and have another bone density test and the T-score is better and it's no longer in the osteoporosis range. And the report might incorrectly say osteopenia. And you're going to be overjoyed to learn that you no longer have osteoporosis. And the insurance company might be happy to hear that too, because you might be taking a drug that's not approved for the treatment of osteopenia. And the, drug, the insurance company might deny payment of that drug. And if you can no longer get that drug, it's possible that you could have a rapid decrease in your bone density and get into a lot of trouble. So what that second DEXA report should say, but often does not, is that you have osteoporosis with a good response to treatment, and it should recommend that treatment be continued. Another mistake that you all may have seen is giving a different diagnosis for every bone that's measured. So I see this every day with uh, bad reports from other facilities. And sometimes I see things like, Osteoporosis at the spine, fracture risk is high. Osteopenia at the hip, fracture risk is moderate. 
normal at the forearm, fracture risk is low. All in the same patient at the same time. So that is wrong. Uh, the standard way uh, to report this is to use the lowest T-score of the spine, hip, or forearm if it's measured and use that for the diagnosis. And as a patient, you should get only one diagnosis, not a different diagnosis for every bone, and one assessment of fracture risk. So, you know, that's some basics about all of this. Uh, and if, if you'd like, I can go into talking about calcium, vitamin D, different drugs that we have. Uh, I can I can keep on talking as long as you want, but if questions are piling up, I'd be happy to answer those. Well, I would like to hear about to, um, maybe address um, maybe some of the before you take a, the questions, if you wouldn't mind, um, more on the um, medications. Why certain medications might be preferable over others for someone. Um, and if there's any determinant, I, yeah. I noticed you had a chart on that in one of the talks I listened to. Yeah, let me t tell you that the, a traditional way for insurance companies to deal with treatment is called step therapy. What step therapy means is that you start off on the cheapest medicine. In the case of osteoporosis, that's generic Fosamax or Alendronate. If that doesn't work, you go up to the next cheapest medicine, which might be uh, reclast. If that doesn't work, maybe they'll cover prolia. And if that doesn't work, maybe they'll cover uh, anabolic therapy or bone building drugs like Forteo, Timlos, or Avenity. Uh, so that approach may be okay for some people, but it may be exactly the wrong approach for other people. So there's a new way of thinking about this where we do what's called fracture risk stratification. And we use our estimation of fracture risk to individualize our treatment decisions. And we do that because we know now that some drugs work better than others. Some give a bigger increase in bone density. Some make your bones stronger. Some reduce fracture risk more than others. And the sequence of treatment is very important. And the, the new guidelines all focus on stratifying fracture risk with the initial evaluation. And when fracture risk is very high, for instance, if your bone density is extremely low or you've had multiple fractures already, then the ideal way to begin treatment is with one of the bone building drugs, the Forteo, Timlos, or Avenity type drug. Now, insurance companies don't like this because those are the most expensive drugs. But the advantage is that these drugs increase bone density more than the traditional drugs. They reduce fracture risk better, and they work best if we start with these rather than wait until you've failed all the other steps with the traditional uh, approach. So that's how we like to think about it now. Now, what we think is best as physicians and patients may still not be what the insurance company is willing to pay for. So we often get into situations where we have to uh, put in a request for insurance approval of the drug that we'd like to have. Uh, the insurance company likes to deny these requests because they're expensive and they don't wanna pay the money. Sometimes we have to appeal uh, that denial, and that involves uh, a lot of time and a lot of nuisance for medical offices, and it's uh, getting to be overwhelming for some places. So that's, uh, the, 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 the insurance companies are hoping we'll give up because it's a lot of work to appeal these and get patients on the drug that we think is best for them. So my, my general feeling is that any treatment is better than no treatment but some treatments are better than others. And the real problem worldwide is that there's a very large osteoporosis treatment gap. So most people in the world, most people in the United States who have osteoporosis are not even being recognized. Those who are known to have osteoporosis are most often not being treated. 
And most people who are started on treatment don't take the treatment long enough to benefit from a reduction in fracture risk. So you are a very elite group of individuals here because you're all aware of osteoporosis and you care about it enough to sign on and listen to me. Uh, but you're a distinct minority in the world of people with osteoporosis. That's, that's a shame, isn't it? Um, yes. Probably earlier detection and things like that would help. Um, to, I think we could take some questions if you'd like. Um, we had some in the chat already. Would you like me to speak about them with you? Um, Whatever you'd like, you can tell me or uh, okay. anybody who has a question can unmute and they can ask it themselves. Um, can't, uh, let me see, who was the first one? <clears throat> um, Eilish uh, said, suggestions for women with breast cancer who are prescribed anti-estrogen drugs or aromatase inhibitors who also have osteoporosis. Uh, aromatase inhibitors are great drugs for breast cancer and very bad for bones. So it's very common for women on aromatase inhibitor therapy to lose a bone and to break bones more than other people. Uh, this is often not fully appreciated by the oncologists who are prescribing it. Uh, so it takes an enlightened oncologist to recognize the potential bone problems and if you already have osteoporosis, that's bad enough to begin with, but you add aromatase inhibitors onto it and you're in a lot more trouble. So there are ways to deal with this. Uh, the drugs most often used in that situation to protect the bones are reclast, which is an IV infusion, or prolia, which is a shot in the arm uh, once every six months when it's used to, to treat the osteoporosis in this situation. Now, uh, there's a complicating factor about this. It's very important to recognize. Sometimes uh, a clever oncologist will recognize uh, the problem with osteoporosis and, and treat with prolia once every six months. But then what happens sometimes, if you finish a five-year course of treatment with an aromatase inhibitor, the oncologist will stop the prolia thinking you no longer need it since you're not taking the aromatase inhibitor. Uh, that can be a very bad thing to do uh, because prolia works terrifically well for six months, but the effects wear off very quickly. After that, if you have five years of prolia and stop it, what will happen if you don't get onto another medicine after that for a osteoporosis, your bone density will rapidly go down and one year later, your bone density will probably be back to where it was before you started the prolia. So it's very important for anybody taking prolia for any reason. If you get off of the prolia for whatever reason, uh, you almost always have to follow it up with some other medicine. You can't take prolia for years and then stop it cold turkey and not do anything else to follow it up. Okay. Any thoughts on zoledronic acid? Zoledronic acid is completely different. It's a bisphosphonate. So the four bisphosphonates are Fosamax, Actinil, Boniva, and Reclass, which is zoledronic acid. Uh, that has a long lasting effect. So when we're treating people for osteoporosis with zoledronic acid, we start off doing it once a year. Uh, sometimes we'll do it once a year for three years in a row. And if there's a very nice response to that treatment, we might try to stretch it out longer than a year with subsequent doses. Because uh, as with all bisphosphonates, uh, this medicine gets uh, attached to the bones, it gets buried in the bones, it gets recycled in the bones. It has a very, very long skeletal half-life uh, of about 10 years or so. So if you have a certain amount of zoledronic acid bones in your uh, drug in your bones right now, and then don't take any more, 10 years from now, you'll have about half that amount in your bones. 
And 10 years after that, you'll have, you know, one quarter of the original amount. And it continues to work for a while. Uh, doesn't work forever. But if you're a little late on a dose for zoledronic acid, it's generally no big deal. If you're late on a dose for prolia, it's a very big deal. And you could wind up with problems in your bones. Can you define late, please? Like more than a month or more than a week, a day? Uh, for prolia, uh, we allow a, a one month window. Uh, and that comes for a reason in the clinical trials for prolia, uh, that's what was uh, allowed. And it seems that uh, you can be up to a, a month late and still not have any big problems with losing bone. We don't like to go longer than a month. And that also relates to having dental surgery. So uh, dentists uh, don't understand osteoporosis very well. I, I love my dentist and he's really great with teeth, but I wouldn't want my dentist to treat osteoporosis. And, and sometimes the dentist will say, well, you have to stop your osteoporosis drug because we're going to do a tooth extraction and I don't want you to get osteonecrosis of the jaw. Well, if you're on uh, denosumab and you stop it, you could get into really big problems uh, with your bones. So what we normally recommend is that if you need a elective invasive dental surgery to do it at the end of the dosing period. So say about five months after your last dose of prolia and then try to stay on schedule uh, and to get that at the normal time or delay it by no more than one month. If uh, you're on prolia and you need emergency dental surgery, if you have a dental abscess, for example, you should do it right away whenever you need it. You should not delay it or stop denosumab because of that. It's important to get your dental problem taken care of immediately. Is that, are you satisfied with that answer? The person who was, did you have any other questions? In other words, that was a great answer, but. Did you have anything else? Okay. I think Karen had a question, Dr. Lohe, on uh, your thoughts concerning um, FDA approved bone score device that was developed by Hansma, Paul Hansma in Bar Santa Barbara that measures bone quality and strength. Uh, I'm not sure what that's referring to. Um, the person who said that was Karen. Could you? Specify what that exact. Um, yeah, yeah. Tell me about that. I'm not sure what it is. Okay, so um, this Paul Hansma, he's um, works in the um, physics department down in Santa Barbara, and he's been working on stuff, and it's finally been it's been um, clinically tested, like the Mayo Clinic, Harvard. Um, Massachusetts General, um, all kinds of places. And it's called the, um, right here, a bone score device. And a doctor can give it to you in his office and it produces, they put um, local anesthetic on your, on your um, shin bone. And it makes some, kind of some pounding um, stuff for 30 seconds. And you get the results right there in the doctor's office and it measures your bone score. And I put the, um, links in there one the article about when it was approved by the fda in 2021 and the other one is about him talking about the device um so it, it he and he uses examples in that where somebody will have a dexa score and then they go to um the doctor and then get this bone score and it can show a different picture, but together he feels like together, he talked about glue. Do you know what bone glue is? He talked about the little follicles and stuff. That's what it was all based on. It came through all that. It's interesting to listen to him talk. Yeah, so let me know what, what you think and it's been okay. approved and if you've heard anything else about it. Okay, first of all, the, the FDA does not approve medical devices. They, they, there's another word for that. They clear medical devices. And all that means is that the, the FDA is stating that it appears to be safe. Uh, but the, uh, approval is different. Approval is what we do for drugs, where we do exhaustive 
clinical trials. It's a much higher level of evidence to have something approved. So lots of devices are cleared. So what this uh, sounds like is a form of micro indentation. And there's a number of countries okay. uh, around the world uh, that do this. So it, it's a little bit like, um, oh, imagine putting a, a ballpoint pen on top of your tibia and then clicking on it so the end of the pen comes out. And it puts a, a little microscopic dent in the bone, in the periosteum of the tibia. And depending on, on the strength of the cortical bone in your periosteum, that determines how far that tip of the pen will go in. And that, that can be measured. So uh, often uh, what uh, will be done with these devices is that uh, multiple indentations will be uh, made and then an average taken basically of how far uh, the, the pen goes into the bone. And it's on a tiny microscopic level. So supposedly it doesn't hurt or doesn't bother anybody when they do it. And it's a, a measure of bone quality. So uh, in a sense, it's a little bit like what TBS does when we do a, a DEXA. It gives us an estimation of your bone structure or your bone quality. And micro indentation uh, gives uh, another estimate of bone quality. So it, it's an interesting device. It's, it's not used very much in the clinical practice setting. It's, uh, uh, it's been done in some research studies and, uh, uh, and it, it's interesting. I, I think it gives us some information that might be a little bit useful, but I, I don't think it's ever gonna take off in a big way for, for thousands of doctors around the country to start you know, making holes in people's tibias to, to see what happens. But it's, it's, it's validated and it's, uh, it, like I said, it's an interesting technology. Yeah. And they, they use it in, in Europe, is that right? He said in Germany, it's, it's used a lot more frequently than it is here. It is. I, I have a friend in Barcelona who does this. He, he did uh, many years ago. He did some of the original research on this and, and, he, and he does it in some of his clinical practice patients. And he, yeah, he's he all... worked with this guy, that guy in Barcelona, Dr. Adolf something. Uh, Adolfo Diaz Perez. Yeah. Yeah. He worked with him. He actually went to him, you know, during the research phase and said, I think you're on to something here. I'd love to work with you. So I just, yeah. um, it seems like Europe gets a lot more of these things like that. Um, what's it called? The Merodyne vibrator platform. That's a lot more used a lot more frequently in Europe too. Have you heard of that? Well, there is a, something called whole body vibration. These are little platforms that you stand on and they vibrate. And uh, the, the idea is that it might stimulate your osteoblast to make more bone and it might help improve your bone density and bone strength. It's a, a terrific idea. The uh, evidence uh, is kind of mixed as to whether it's helpful or not. And one, one of the challenges with this is that there's so many varieties of these devices by different manufacturers that use a different frequency of vibration, different amplitude of vibration, different uh, duration of time that you stand on it, a different number of days per week. Some people do it barefoot, some people do it with shoes, some people lock their knees, some people bend their knees. So there's so many variables here that uh, nobody's I, I, quite proven to me and, and to most other people that there's one particular way that actually works and really improves the bone density. And in fact, uh, a, a study was done uh, out of uh, Harvard by a friend of mine in, in Boston and they went out to the uh, uh, to, to Linden Ponds in Hingham, where my mom and dad were living. That's a retirement center in Hingham. And they brought this device out and they took a bunch of the retirees and they tested it uh, for a year or a couple of years. And um, they compared it with people who didn't do it. And uh, at the end, they found no significant difference in bone density in either group. So it was disappointing. And I would like for it to work. I, I think it, if it worked, it might be great, not 
for all of us here, but uh, it might be terrific for people who have impaired uh, ambulation. If you think about spinal cord injury patients or stroke patients or people who are paralyzed uh, for other reasons, if they could stand on a vibration platform like this and actually get some benefit in improving their bone strength and reducing fracture risk, I, I think that would be a terrific thing. But we, we need more evidence before we can feel confident that that's actually the case. Um, that's excellent. I, uh, you know, a question that comes up a lot, and someone asked it as well in the chat, Dr. Lewicki, is about the, um, as we used to call it, hormone replacement therapy, or now they're calling it bioidentical hormone treatment, but um, uh, because of the difference. And anyway, but um, just that uh, it's becoming more acceptable now, now that that study has been refuted that came out in 2003 or something, that we, um, it seems like it's becoming more accepted. I don't think the insurance companies are accepting it, but the doctors are, uh, you know, we've had some people talk about it. So do you think if that were to be approved that we would see a decrease in the frequency of osteoporosis? Well, I just came back from a, a meeting of the Menopause Society in Philadelphia, where there were over a thousand people interested in hormone therapy and other things for menopause. And the study you're referring to is called the Women's Health Initiative. And that was a tremendously large study that gave women estrogen or some women got no estrogen and they compared the groups. And this study was prematurely stopped uh, because it was felt by people who were following this that the risks outweighed the benefit of continuing the study. Uh, since then, there's been hundreds of different analyses of the data to try and find out what all this means. And uh, it turns out that uh, uh, a lot of this risk uh, has to do with the age uh, when you're taking estrogens. And the general feeling now is that uh, uh, estrogen, well, first of all, is a great way to treat menopausal symptoms. And estrogen for the first 10 years or so after the onset of medicine appears to be very safe. Uh, the older you are, the greater uh, the risk of things like heart attacks and strokes from taking estrogen. Uh, estrogen uh, was shown in that study to reduce the risk of fractures, even in women who were not at very high risk of fracture in the first place. So the bottom line nowadays in, in our thinking, and it may be different next year, but uh, uh, the feeling is that um, for women uh, in the early postmenopausal years, especially ones that have Osteoporosis, estrogen can be a good treatment for osteoporosis and a good way to prevent osteoporosis. But because of concern about side effects, it's not approved by the FDA for treatment of osteoporosis. It's only approved for prevention of osteoporosis. But I, I, I think estrogen certainly has a place and prevention of osteoporosis has a place too. Uh, most of the guidelines that doctors are using nowadays are focused on identifying patients at high risk for fracture and treating them with drugs. And if you're not at high uh, risk for fracture, don't treat with drugs. So that makes sense on a certain level. Uh, however, uh, someone who has osteopenia and is watching their bone density go down every year may not want to wait until they're at high risk for fracture before they do something about it. So my wife was one of those. Uh, she had osteopenia. Every year she checked her bone density. It was getting worse and worse and worse. It still wasn't osteoporosis, but she didn't want to wait. So we decided to give her some medicine to put a stop to the bone loss. And we did that. Bone density increased and it stayed good for the last couple of years. And she's, she's very happy with that. So uh, that's a, a matter of discussion between the patient and the doctor. So that's called shared decision-making. 
So when I see somebody with osteopenia in the early postmenopausal years, uh, I talk to them about drugs such as uh, estrogen or other drugs that can treat the osteoporosis and uh, treat the osteopenia. And I tell them, look, uh, you don't have osteoporosis, your fracture risk is not high. You're perfectly justified in treating this with calcium and vitamin D and healthy lifestyle. And if you wanna do that, terrific. However, if you're more prevention oriented and you don't wanna wait until you're at high risk for fracture before you do something, we can do something. And we have medicines like estrogen and reclass, for example, and alendronate that we use for that purpose. And they work very well. So I think every woman needs to make a personal decision about what she feels most comfortable with. Excellent. Um, thank you. Now, um, doctor, do you recommend having a CTX and a P1NP before someone goes on medication uh, during their time on medication? Um, and how, how frequently would you recommend? Well, these, uh, these tests are classified as bone turnover markers. So the CTX is a marker of bone resorption, and that represents the activity of your osteoclasts, the bone resorbing cells that make little pits in our bones. The P1NP is a marker of bone formation, and that represents the activity of your osteoblasts that are filling in those little holes that the osteoclasts make. Uh, you know, medical experts have a broad range of opinions about using bone turnover markers. Um, some doctors say they use them for everybody with osteoporosis. Some doctors say they never use them. Uh, I kind of like bone turnover markers myself and, and I use them selectively. So as with any test, we shouldn't do it unless there's a reason to do it and unless it might influence how we treat people. Uh, but I can give you some examples of how we might use it. Uh, say uh, we start somebody on uh, a lendronate, and I'm concerned that it may not be absorbed well in this particular patient. I might measure a CTX uh, before starting treatment and repeat it three months later. And what I'd like to see is a big decrease in that, representing a decrease in the activity of the osteoclast. And if I get a nice change like that, that tells me that the patient's taking the drug, it's being absorbed, it's having the expected effect on the bones, and we'll keep it up. And if I repeat the CTX three months later, and it's exactly the same as baseline, then something's wrong. They're either not taking the drug or it's not getting absorbed or something else is going on. And that has to be investigated. And we use it sometimes with uh, bone building drugs. Say we start somebody on uh, Forteo or Timlos. We might measure a bone formation marker like P1NP at baseline. And if a patient doesn't want to wait for a year or two to find out how well the medicine is working, we can repeat that P1NP about a month later. And what we like to see is a nice increase in that number. And that gives some reassurance uh, to the patient and to me that uh, the medicine is working, it's stimulating the osteoblasts, they're getting a nice effect, and that's predictive that there'll be a nice increase in bone density when we repeat that eventually. Okay. And it's a good incentive for the patient since they're taking an expensive drug that probably involves daily injections at home. Uh, it tells them it's worthwhile to continue this and uh, makes them feel a little bit better about the whole thing. It's really great. Um, I, I saw a um, slide you did, you had given a, a talk. I just wanted to ask if you would share this with the group because I thought it was so helpful. And a lot of the questions I noticed sort of reflect the same chart, but it's the risk stratification and implications. Um, so like, for example, the T-score um, at different levels and um, when you would recommend pharmacological um, intervention and when you don't and what's low, moderate, high, very high, extremely high. <laughs> Do you remember that slide or should I try to bring that up? Uh, I, I, I could dig it out if you want. I, um, uh, 
I, I that use that so slide a good. lot. Um, I, um, I can too. I have it on my computer if you want me to. If you've got it, you could probably find it faster than I could. I, okay, give me a second and maybe someone while I'm looking, someone can ask you another question. I'd like, I, I, I would like to ask a question about the various people like Irma Jennings who recommend diet and exercise and have not, they, they've reversed the numbers of their osteoporosis diagnosis. Um, and uh, what I'm hearing tonight sounds very pharmacological for a good reason, but um, what do you, what do you, um, I mean, of course you see people as a physician, you see people at all levels of osteoporosis. So I'm wondering what uh, about the diet and exercise approach? Well, we, we, we didn't have a chance to get to that, but uh, yes, um, uh, diet and exercise are extremely important for all of us. Um, the, uh, the basic care for uh, all of us, so whether we have osteoporosis or not, is to uh, have regular weight bearing and muscle strengthening physical activity, to have an adequate intake of calcium, uh, about 1200 milligrams a day is recommended through uh, diet, uh, and to have an adequate intake of uh, vitamin D, and we shoot for a vitamin D blood level somewhere between 30 and 50. Uh, so all of those are uh, essential things, and uh, they will help medicine uh, to work better. We generally don't expect those things alone to improve bone density. Uh, they can at the extremes. So if you are doing a very vigorous resistance exercise under supervision for a long time, it's possible that you might get a modest improvement in your bone density. Uh, but that's far beyond what most people are willing to do. And we know that from, from clinical trials. We, we, we do clinical trials with uh, thousands of women getting a drug and thousand, thousands of women getting a placebo. Uh, they're all advised to exercise and take calcium and vitamin D. And what happens with the drug that works is that bone density goes up and the women who take placebo, bone density stays about the same or goes down. Now, if you're training for the Olympic powerlifting uh, event and are willing to work out, you know, lifting heavy weights for many hours every day for month after month after month, uh, yeah, you might have an increase in bone density. If you're a professional tennis player, you're going to have bigger and stronger bones in your racket arm than you are in your other arm. Uh, but most of these things like that are extremes of exercise and just not the kind of things that most of us normal people are willing to do. We also know that at the other extreme, lack of uh, exercise is very bad. So I do some work with uh, uh, NASA with, uh, with astronauts and we know in the International Space Station that uh, on average astronauts can lose about 1% bone mass per month uh, when they're weightless. Uh, that's 10 times the age-related rate of bone loss that we expect on planet Earth. Uh, we know in spinal cord injury patients, uh, they lose a very large amount of bone in the first six months to a year after being at bed rest. So extreme lack of exercise is very bad. Extreme exercise might be beneficial. And for all the rest of us, it's good to do, but I wouldn't expect miracles from it. Very good. I, I think I could share this slide right now, uh, if I could real quick. Um, there we go. Um, this was it. Yeah, that's my fracture risk stratification slide. So this is a, 
a, a combination of guidelines from two societies, the Endocrine Society and the, another one called uh, ACE. So the idea here is that when we first see a patient, we try to estimate what their fracture uh, risk level is, and we put that into categories uh, such as low, moderate, high, and very high. And then these organizations have provided uh, examples of what constitutes those levels of risk. So it's, so it's not even exactly the same as a definition, but they're just examples, and they might be uh, there might be other good examples as well. But you see at the top where the fracture risk is low, uh, where the T-score is very good, there's been no fractures, and uh, FRAX shows low fracture risk, uh, the treatment is non-pharmacological. Uh, then we get to moderate when the patient has uh, osteopenia and there's no fractures that um, non-pharmacological might be okay, uh, or you might consider a bisphosphonate, or this is the case where estrogen might certainly be a possibility. When fr fracture risk is high, then we start thinking about bisphosphonates or denosumab or a CIRM. So that's a CIRM is Evista or raloxifene, which is kind of a designer estrogen. And then what's new in these guidelines that didn't used to be present in the previous version of the guidelines was the category of very high risk. And that's where anabolic or bone building drug comes into play. So there's different examples of very high risk, such as a, a T-score this minus 2.5 or below and having fractures, having multiple vertebral fractures or severe vertebral fractures. Now, there's nothing wrong if you're at very high risk to be treated with a bisphosphonate or prolia. Uh, that's perfectly fine, and that's a whole lot better than nothing. But ideally, if you want the very best and most aggressive therapy, that would be to begin with an anabolic drug at that particular time. Does that make sense? Yes. Well, does everyone? May I ask a question about that? Yeah, yes. It, if I, I'm having a little, it was fairly small on my screen, so I wasn't sure, but it didn't look like there was a, a category for a patient who had better than 2.5 um, and had a fracture. So in other words, osteopenic and uh, having a fracture. My understanding now is that that is classified as someone who probably needs to have um, a pharmacological in, in intervention, but I didn't see that on, on the chart. Well, I guess the chart doesn't cover everything, but the, yeah, if, if you have a, a fracture that shouldn't be happening to somebody with normal bones, we call that osteoporosis, even when the T-score is better than minus 2.5. We also know that uh, it's a very high risk situation with a recent fracture. And there's a term for that called eminent fracture risk. And if someone's had a recent fracture, their risk of another fracture in the next year is very high. And that's why some people will call a fracture a bone attack the same way that a myocardial infarction is called a heart attack or a stroke might be called a brain attack. If you have a recent fracture, that's a fairly urgent clinical situation where we'd like to evaluate uh, what might be causing the bones to be weak. We'd like to do a bone density test and we'd like to get treatment started fairly early. And if fracture risk is very high, the anabolic drugs are the best of all drugs to start treatment with. Very good. Wondering if you can make a comment about um, uh, mm, blanking on the name Fosamax versus uh, Reclast after Forteo. I, I was on Forteo for three years. It did pretty well, and then it kind of petered out. And there was a difference of opinion about whether I should go on Fosamax to pervert or to preserve the gain or Reclast. Reclast made me a little nervous. It felt like using a hammer. Um, rather than uh, something lighter than that. Uh, so I wonder if you had an opinion on that. Well, I do fracture risk stratification after finishing Forteo. 
And the, the, the two categories of drugs we might use to follow up would either be the bisphosphonates or, or prolia. So if the bone density is still very low after Forteo, I like prolia because that will give a bigger increase in bone density than uh, uh, bisphosphonates. So alendronate and reclast are both bisphosphonates. They, they work in pretty similar ways. I actually prefer the reclast just because it's, uh, it's longer lasting and more convenient. It's generic, it's cheap. Uh, some people jump at the idea of uh, getting an IV infusion and being covered for a whole year or longer. Some people hate the idea of an IV infusion and would much rather take pills. But I, I think it's really a matter of personal preference whether you take one or the other. It's not a, not a big medical difference. But the efficacy is the same. Pretty much, yeah, pretty much the same. And could you just clarify why you like the Prolia better? Oh, Prolia will give a bigger increase in bone density. So the, the pattern of what happens to bone density with all the bisphosphonates is that it will typically increase for the first couple of years and then plateau. Right. And you can keep on taking the medicine forever and the bone density won't get any higher. Uh, so if you start off with a very low bone density, it might increase and plateau at a level that's still very low. And maybe that's not the best situation. On the other hand, with prolia, bone density goes up the first couple of years and the next couple of years and the next couple of years. And as far as we know, as long as you keep on taking it, bone density will keep on increasing. So for people that start off with very low levels, uh, that's a big advantage over the bisphosphonates. Thank you. My, my uh, after uh, Forteo, mine is uh, negative 3.0 on the spine. It's, it has improved. Okay, so you must have been very low to begin with then before that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, you've got choices. Uh, you know, you'd get a, you'll, in the long run, you'll get a bigger increase in bone density if you went with prolia instead of one of the bisphosphonates. The disadvantage of prolia is that you're locked into getting it every six months, and it's probably for lifetime that you need to keep on taking it. So you got to be willing to make that long term kind of decision. I am. Thank you very much. Why, why I, th is I thought you couldn't. Can I ask? Oh, excuse me. Yeah, Charlie, I didn't think you could take prolia after like three years or so. There is no time limit for prolia. Uh, we have evidence from the clinical trials of uh, women taking it continuously for 10 years. And every one of those years, bone density keeps on increasing. And what we saw in the clinical trials was on average, about a 22% increase in bone density at the spine. So that is really a tremendous improvement in bone density. With a bisphosphonate, we might increase bone density at the spine by six or 7% and then it stops. So quite a difference. Would you recommend, this is a different question, someone who's taking prolia to do blood te uh, bone, bone turnover tests? Bone turnovers? Well, I, I generally do not do bone turnover markers on prolia because it is such a strong anti-resorptive medications that the bone turnover markers are always very low. Just another quick question. If an 85 year old has broken a bone in the, this year, in the past year, and uh, has stenosis of the spine, so very difficult to do a bone density, would you switch her from Fosamax to Prolia? Uh, well, I, I consider it. Uh, it, it it's very common uh, as we get older that, that we get our osteoarthritis in the spine. And it's not such a good place to measure bone density, but usually the hips are still perfectly fine. So we do like to measure two different bones in the body. So when the spine is no good for bone density testing, we'll normally measure the hip and the forearm. And the hip is a good place to monitor changes in bone density as well. So that can give us some useful information. So you'd recommend that she get a bone density in her hip and her forearm. In Canada, they don't do the forearm, but she can get it in her hip. Oh, well, do the hip. Yeah, for sure. Okay. All right, thank you. A doctor, uh, um, 
for you in the slide, you did mention the very high risk. You said that uh, it is less or equal to 2.5 for T score, and then you have fracture. And the fracture, I mean, it can be anywhere. It doesn't have to be multiple fractures, like just one spine fracture with the T score less or equal to 2.5. That would qualify for for a uh, very high risk already, right? Yeah, well, there's many myth, many different variations of all this. So uh, having a recent fracture is, is a, represents a higher risk than a fracture a long time ago. With fractures in the spine, a, a severe fracture where there's total flattening of the vertebral body is a lot more serious than a little tiny fracture where there's a minor loss of height in the vertebral body. We worry a lot more about multiple vertebral fractures than we do about a single vertebral fracture. And each different type of fracture imparts a little bit different level of future risk. So we worry a lot about spine fractures and hip fractures and pelvic fractures. But And if you have an ankle fracture, well, most of the time, that's not a good thing. And it probably increases your risk of future fractures a little bit but not nearly as worrisome as some of the major fractures uh, of, of some of the bigger bones. So there's just an infinite number of variations that we encounter with all these things. So uh, we have to put all that into our little formula when we think about it and then come up with the best decision based on what we know. Yes, and when you say very low um, density, that means the T-score is, is less than minus three or is it higher than that? I mean, is there a it, definition? It, it's kind of a vague definition. Some people say less than minus 3.0. Some people might say less than minus 3.5, but it's getting pretty low when it's down in the, in the low threes. <laughs> I see, and you did not mention the side effects from those medications. I heard that reclass, the side effects like jawbone necrosis, that those things can be higher than oral bisphosphonates. Is that true? Yeah. Probably not quite true, uh, but it depends how you look at it. Um, the risk of osteonecrosis of the jaw is very, very low with, with any of the bisphosphonates. It's probably somewhere between one in 100,000 and one in 10,000 patients. Uh, in people who get uh, reclassed, it's cancer patients who take very large doses of this who are very sick people to begin with. And they have a higher risk of osteonecrosis of the jaw than osteoporosis patients. So generally patients getting it for osteoporosis are getting a far lower dose than cancer patients and they're generally healthier than cancer patients. So, so the, the risk of osteonecrosis of the jaw is a lot less. Uh, and with the oral bisphosphonates like uh, alendronate, it, it, if you take it long enough, it probably also has an increased risk of osteonecrosis of the jaw. But it's a very, very low risk. So it could happen to you. It could happen to anybody. It happens to some people who have never taken an osteoporosis medicine too. So uh, you, you just have to, when we decide anything about medicine, we do our best to uh, balance the benefits uh, versus the possible uh, risks of treatment. And if we feel that the benefits far outweigh the risks, then it's usually worthwhile uh, treating. But uh, it's, it's not any different than things you do every day. When you get in your car to drive to the grocery store, there's a risk that you could get killed in a head-on collision. Uh, that's a pretty serious risk. Uh, you might not get killed. You might just be paralyzed and uh, you know be in the hospital the rest of your life. That's another risk of driving your car, but you feel that the benefits are worth the risk. You think the risks are pretty low. Uh, so you go ahead and you drive to the grocery store because you need the groceries. So it's no different with any medicine for anything. I see. Yeah. And do you give any virtual um, clinic visit by telemedicine? Uh, yes, but um, it's gotten very complicated as to what's uh, legal and what 
Medicare will allow. So currently, it, and it's a little different in, in each state, but currently, as far as I know, we can do televisits with people who are in a state where we have a license to practice medicine. So my license is in New Mexico, so I can do televisits with people in New Mexico, uh, but I'm not allowed to do televisits in uh, people in other states who, uh, where I don't have a, a license to practice medicine. And that may change, uh, you know, they, the exceptions to that were made during the time of COVID when it was really bad. And um, one problem is that every state has its own rules and regulations about medical licenses. And what I would like to see is a national medical license so that if you're licensed in one state, you're licensed in all other states and that would remove a lot of those uh, obstacles for telemedicine. So we'll see what happens. Wouldn't that be great? Thank you. That yeah. Wonderful. Um, I have a question. Um, I was taking Actinol and had real stomach issues. And so it wasn't good quality of life at all. So I stopped taking it. And now I'm not on anything. I have um, a T score of minus 2.8 in the spine. And I'm not sure what to do next. I just know I do not want to live life with stomach issues every day. Yeah, well, this happens all the time. So if you can't take an oral bisphosphonate, then you get an IV bisphosphonate or you switch to polio. So most of the time in your situation, what we do is, is give reclast or uh, prolia, one or the other. Okay, so from your experience, they don't um, give people stomach problems? No, we, we, that, that's a common reason to use them when people have GI intolerance to oral bisphosphonates, which is pretty common. Uh, we go with one of the injectable medicines. I mean, uh, the injectables have their own possible side effects too, uh, but I wouldn't expect it to cause the same stomach problems. Okay, thank you. Also, I just want to say, I don't know how long uh, we can uh, have Dr. Lewicki with us. I mean, I'd love to have him all night, but um, maybe we should um, make sure everyone gets at least one question and we of, of maybe the next five people and then maybe uh, we should, I don't know how. I, okay, I let's, let's do five. You, Dr. Okay. Five more questions. That, okay, work. all right. Um, so, and please, if they could be from new people that have not spoken yet. So I have a question on, a couple of questions on Evinity. And uh, the first one is, do you have a preference for the drug that follows Evinity? And I'm guessing from what I'm hearing you say, it's probably gonna be Prolia, but I'll let you answer that. And the second question is- Oh, wait a minute. You can't ask more than we have to okay. get five people. I'm sorry. All right. Okay. Well, well let me we'll ask do... my second question first then. Okay. Okay. Forget that question. This <laughs> second question. You're, you're is, sneaky. Any thoughts on a repeated course of Evinity? Well, that's uh, allowable. Uh, it's, it's approved for treatment uh, for one year, but there's nothing to say we can't do it for another year. So, uh, yeah, that, that could be done. I, I, I don't think I've done it yet for anybody, but if, if, it turns out that somebody is still at very high risk for fracture and they need a strong medication, I might give it a second time. So it could be fine. We don't have a whole lot of medical evidence about that. So uh, it's an area that we need to learn more about. Okay, thank you. I, I have a quick question to follow up with that about the Avinity. Would you ever follow for Teo with Avinity if you still had severe osteoporosis? Yeah, I, I, I might consider it, but probably not do it uh, directly after. I might wait a, a year and you know, give something else in, in between. Um, th th we, we need to learn a lot about uh, sequential therapy of two different uh, anabolic drugs. So I, I have had the experience where somebody 
finished one year of Avenity and uh, for dental reasons, uh, I couldn't use a bisphosphonate or prolia. So I went straight from Avenity to Timlos. And uh, I checked bone turnover markers and watched bone density. And that patient actually had continuing improvement uh, with uh, transitioning from one anabolic agent to another. So that's one patient that doesn't tell us a whole lot except about one patient. But uh, I think we're going to be seeing more and more research studies about these kinds of uh, sequential therapies and combination therapies. And uh, hopefully over the next couple of years, we'll learn a lot more about how to do that. I have a quick question about um, being on reclast after with a very bad T-score still minus point minus four. Um, and I've been on it three years. I figure it'll be five years. But what do you recommend in that situation after five years of reclass? I've responded well, you know, it went from 4.5 to four, but still and I had Forteo years ago and I followed it and, and it I lost it all and I did this was I started before they allowed two courses of Forteo yeah well uh, this is a, a situation where you might think about going to a medication that will give you a bigger increase in bone density we, we know that the more the bone density goes up the stronger your bones are, are going to get and we know that prolia will give uh, a bigger increase in bone density uh, than uh, the reclass. So there might be some advantages in switching to that. Uh, you could go on one of the anabolic drugs uh, after you know getting multiple injections of reclass. Uh, however, the the best response to the anabolic drugs is before the bisphosphonates rather than after. Right. And there, there has been a, a study, uh, it's called the structure study that was done in, in Denmark. And patients who were on uh, bisphosphonates were switched directly to either Forteo or Avenity. And the response to Avenity was much better than the response to Forteo. So if you wanted the, the, the strongest possibility for a medicine uh, after getting the reclass, then that might be the Avenity. Okay, thank you. Since, since you're talking about Avenity, could you also address some of the concerns with the black box warning and some of the side effects, adverse effects from that medication? Well, be, that's your second to last question. And then have you asked one yet, Deb? No. Okay. Then we'll have one more after Deb and that's it. Thank you, doctor. Okay, uh, <laughs> there, uh, there is a, a, a warning not to use Avenity in someone who's had a heart attack or a stroke in, in the last year. And that's because of conflicting evidence in clinical trials. The truth is there's, uh, there's just uncertainty. We don't know if this drug has any effect on cardiovascular risk or not. The, the biggest study with Avenity was called FRAME with uh, 7,000 women randomized to get Avenity or placebo. And there was no difference in heart attacks and strokes in the two groups. So no difference at all. There was another study called ARCH that compared uh, Avenity with Alendronate. And in that study, there were a few more patients uh, in the uh, Venity group who had heart attacks and strokes compared to Alendronate. And frankly, the, the finest cardiologists in the world analyzed this data over and over again, and they couldn't really decide whether Avenity might increase the risk, uh, whether the Alendronate reduced the risk, or it was just a, a statistical fluke and didn't mean anything. So, and I don't know if we're ever going to have the answer, but to be overly cautious, the FDA put that boxed warning in. Thank you. Hi, I'm going to jump in. Um, you mentioned a lot about TBS, um, but most of us have been told that if we have a diagnosis of osteoporosis, it's not going to be helpful. And so our um, doctors don't order it. Um, but I'm wondering if you've heard of 
um, echo light as another way to evaluate the structure of the bone? Well, echo light doesn't really exactly look at bone structure. E echo light is a form of uh, ultrasound that can generate uh, a bone density number and a T-score that's the company says is equivalent to doing a, a standard DEXA. So it, it, it's a way of measuring bone density that does not involve radiation with a device that's more portable than a DEXA machine. Uh, it seems to be getting uh, increased uh, in popularity in Europe, uh, not so much in this country. Uh, it's we've tried that we we played with the echo light device at our place. It's uh, it, it was uh, it was tough to do it correctly. You need a, an experienced uh, ultrasonographer or technologist to be able to get accurate measurements out of it. But I I know that uh, some doctors in Europe use it. They have it in their office and they use it as a substitute for DEXA. But I'm oh. I'm not sure how much complementary information it gives us. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. And uh, everyone, thank, let's thank Dr. Lewicki for his time tonight that definitely thank went over so time. Much. And uh, we appreciate you so much. And, you know, I know it was an interesting last question for someone who's such an expert in densitometry, uh, what your opinions on all of these things are. But of course, you know, so much you've done on medications as well. So we've really gotten uh, a lot of information tonight, and I very appreciate, very much appreciative of it. Thank you. Well, well thank you for having me, and and I've got to say congratulations on such a great group. You know, I've I've been to a number of osteo support groups, and you are by far the best I've ever seen. <laughs> so uh, keep up the good work. <laughs> thank you so much.